Just what we needed to introduce this sermon this morning, that song. Thank you so much. We're looking at John chapter 19, right where we were last week. Verse 28 to 30. Let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's word and remain standing for a short prayer. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Lord, we pray that you'll help us as we look at this passage that's already been alluded to in this song, I Thirst. So we just pray that you will uh, move us forward as we look at Jesus on the cross. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe may be seated. During Lent, we've been preaching the seven last statements Jesus made from the cross, his, his famous last words. That's what we're titling it. And we kind of got hung up because of a couple of Sundays where we <laughs> had to cancel. Uh, spring is coming. Amen. Uh, uh, eventually, it will be here. Uh, possibility of snow again, but it, spring may come. Uh, I'm dreaming of a white Mother's Day. That's what I'm dreaming of. <laughs> you know, I thought, thought it would be different this year. We don't have white Christmases. Maybe we can have white Mother's Days or something, you know, uh, just, just saying. I'm not complaining or anything. <laughs> <laughs> But the seven last statements of Jesus on the cross, we're, we're still trying to fill in some slots. But um, his first statement was a prayer. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they just can't get away from that. The first thing Jesus thought of when they were killing him was forgiveness to those that were afflicting him. His second statement was to the repentant robber on the cross beside him. He said, surely to, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Forgiveness had an immediate conversion. The first convert of Christianity, as far as I'm concerned. Jesus' third statement was to his mother and to the disciple John. It was at the foot of the cross. It says, woman, behold your son. And John, behold your mother. And today we look at the fifth statement of Jesus from the cross, I thirst. And last Sunday we looked at the sixth statement, which is it is finished. And then next Sunday we'll look at the seventh statement, Lord willing, if we're not snowed in. Which says, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. As we look at this fifth statement of Jesus from the cross, I thirst, it's two words in English, but it's like it is finished. It's only one word in the Greek text. I thirst is one word. It is finished is one word that Jesus utters and speaks out. But this word gives us a glimpse into the physical struggle Jesus was enduring as he died. And as each sermon each week I've quoted a famous last word from someone um, who is dying and the last words that they said every, each week. And um, last week was really interesting. The guy who took his own pulse and said, stopped, uh, and pronounced his own death. Um, and uh, for it is finished. But today I want to look at uh, Benjamin Franklin. As Benjamin Franklin lay dying at the age of 84, his daughter told him to change position in bed so that he could breathe more easily. And uh, Franklin's last words, as she was trying to adjust him and, 
we, can, we need to do this so you can breathe more easily. He said, a dying man can do nothing easy. A dying man can do nothing easy. I thought how appropriate Jesus saying, I thirst. Because he was a dying man. His death was not easy. It was not easy. Why was this statement included in John's account? I think dehydration that Jesus was facing right there emphasized three ideas. The first is, I thirst emphasized prophecy fulfillment. I'm going to have to build to this um, so you can see it, but I haven't mentioned it before. But I've been intrigued in this study with how the gospel writers each chose different statements to include in their crucifixion accounts. And I don't know if you realize this, but John, right here in this passage, he makes three statements of Jesus. He records three. The one about Jesus saying, John, take care of my mother. And uh, mother, you are now the responsibility of John. I thirst and it is finished. John's the only one that records those three. Dr. Luke, who is a contemporary with Paul and came a while later, he wrote about three of them. Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. He also records Jesus saying to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. And he's the one who records the other prayer of Jesus, which is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's the only one that records those three. Three and three. Totally different. And then Matthew and Mark, the two of them record the other statement of Jesus on the cross. When darkness came and covered the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour, and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the only one they record. It's just kind of interesting to me to think about that, that I'm just glad that we have four accounts written on the life of Christ so that we can get a better picture of what it all means. Aren't you glad? Because if we just read any one of those, we would see at the most just three statements of Jesus from the cross. But we get the full picture from all four of them, and we understand he had seven different statements that were so powerful, each one meaning a lot. So John is obviously making a special emphasis as he adds these two words of Jesus in his gospel. And for a clue, we notice verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now John was there at the cross, and Jesus had given him the responsibility for taking care of Mary, his mother. So John had watched Jesus suffer now for six hours. And John wanted his readers to know that Jesus was completing the task for which he had come to earth. Jesus, he writes, knowing that all things were now accomplished, said, I thirst. The physical pain had been intense. The weight of darkness and sin had been born until Jesus could stand it no longer. Jesus did not give in to Satan and sin and darkness. His mission had been accomplished. Jesus, knowing that all things had now been accomplished. Jesus was at that point. He only had a couple more statements to make. He only had a couple more minutes to live. And he would be done with the cross. He would have finished God's plan of salvation. He was down to the end. All things have been accomplished. Notice the second reason. Not just that God was going to fulfill the plan of salvation through Jesus. It was all going to be accomplished. But he said that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Now 
Now, John had observed Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and many other Old Testament passages being fulfilled in the life and the death of Jesus. In fact, John mentions more scriptures fulfilled in verses 36 and 37 right here, the passage. Later on, after Jesus is dead, he talks about the fact that it fulfills a scripture where they pierced him in the side. And another scripture where he said, and no bones would be broken. John is, is mentioning scripture after scripture of Jesus being fulfilled. And he says, knowing that the mission had been accomplished, and Jesus, knowing that the scriptures were being fulfilled, said, I thirst. John had just heard the cry of Jesus, quoting Psalm 22, where he says in verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So John pulled it all together and stated that Jesus was fulfilling one more prophecy when he rasped out these words, I thirst. Again, we turn back to Psalm 22, verses 14, 15, where David wrote these words of the crucifixion scene that somehow were given to David, and he wrote them out, starting with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But these words particularly point out to this message. David wrote, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Which is where I get the idea that some people feel like they pulled their arms out of the sockets as they were straightening them out on the cross. They would resist less. My heart is like wax. You know what it's like to have blood like wax? It doesn't flow too well. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. I mean, okay, take an old dried out piece of pottery that's been laying outside in the hot sun. And he says, my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. John wrote that one reason Jesus said, I thirst, was to fulfill this scripture. Maybe there's another one in his mind, but this is the one that comes to my mind. My friends, there's an important warning here for us. If John realized the death of Jesus was a direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, then we need to realize that the biblical prophecies about us and about our future <laughs> are going to come to pass. See, many people missed the prophecies that John got. And as he was writing, he keeps referring back, well, here's one that said this about Jesus, and this one said this about Jesus. And he's saying, look, they're being fulfilled. And Jesus is reaching the point where everything has been accomplished and all the scriptures are being fulfilled. And he says, I thirst. And they missed it. They missed the reality of these prophecies in Jesus' first coming. And I wonder, we must not miss the importance of the prophecies and the reality that's coming called Jesus' second coming. Because it's going to happen just like it happened the first time. Isn't that interesting? There's going to be the rapture. There's going to be an antichrist. There's going to be a mark of the beast. There's going to be a tribulation. There's going to be a millennium. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be heaven. There's going to be hell. There's going to be all these things that are talked about. It's going to happen, folks. Just pointing it out that the words I thirst emphasize prophecy fulfillment. There's a second idea to consider here. I thirst, number two, emphasize Jesus' physical suffering. A physical thirst is one of the most powerful desires the human body has. We drink 
a lot. And I am on an antibiotic and it's dehydrating me. And so it's really cool this morning that I am constantly thirsty while I'm preaching this. I am. And I've been down there sucking the bottle all through the song service, but this is this true. One of the most uncomfortable things is to be thirsty. Uh, we are constantly told how important it is. Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. We have all seen the, the runners that are, or bikers and all different kind of things when they're, when they're out there. Even in, in, the, um, in the ball fields, what do they do when they come in to the sidelines? I mean, and, and, and there's, a, there's a timeout, and they got guys running around with these bottles and squirting it in, you know. <laughs> And, and then they're spitting it all over their everything. And, I mean, it's a constant thing. As, as the runners are going by, they have periodic tables set up and stations where they know it's about time for them to get a drink. And some of them pour it over their heads and keep on going, you know. But most of them are guzzling it down. The loss of body fluid due to perspiration and in. Endeavor has to be replenished. In fact, Gatorade itself was designed for that very purpose. Isn't that interesting? The whole story behind that. Water was not enough. So some smart guy to develop Gatorade to replenish I have been with many hospice patients towards the end of life, and, and for some of them, dehydration was an issue. When the body is shutting down, one of the things that happens is, for some, uh, choking hazards. And so you're no longer allowed to give them drinks. I have sat there, and they would beg me, can I please... Have some water. And so we have these little sticks. They look like sucker sticks, just about, but they're a little stronger than that. And on the end of it is a little sponge. I can't give you water, I'm sorry. But I'll do this. And you dip that thing in there, put it in their mouth, and they go... Squeezing out drops of water into their moisture into their mouth. I wish I had one this morning. Anybody got some? <laughs> Just a little cool drips of water to wet their mouth. Oh, that feels so good, they will say. And I'll dip it in there again. It's no wonder Jesus said sometimes if you just do a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. Right? means so much. Well, Jesus is dehydrated. He knows what it means to be thirsty. Now, remember the, the story. Of course, Jesus on Thursday night was there with the disciples in the upper room, and they, they had the bread, they had the, the wine, and that was the last drink Jesus got. He went out afterwards into the garden, and was so involved in the burden of prayer that it said that he, as he was praying, was sweating drops of blood. He was dehydrating in prayer, physically sweating. According to Luke twenty two forty four, And then it says that he went to the trial. And then from there, they took him back and ripped his clothes off and beat him up until blood was flowing all over the place, dehydrating, whipped him, scourged him. Went back for more trial. Crown of thorns on his head. 
capillaries in the head, they say, bleed real freely. Then they take him out to the cross. And they finally offer him a drink, sour wine mixed with a narcotic, so that most of the soldiers would, would offer this and, the, and the, the criminals would take it that were being crucified because it would help dull the pain of what they were going to face over the next few hours. So they had it ready and available, but he refused to take it. He did not want the mixture of the narcotic. That drink would have dulled the pain, and Jesus didn't want to take the easy way out, so he refused the little bit of moisture that perhaps he could have gotten from that. Then they nailed him to the cross, and he hung on that cross for six hours, again, still bleeding, fresh wounds. Three hours were in bright daylight sunlight. As the sun was reaching the zenth, the peak of the day. And then three hours in darkness. His body was drained, his tongue was like a stick in his mouth, his lips were cracked, he could barely talk. He was dried, drained. And Jesus still had something else to say. It was the end. And before he died, he wanted to shout, it is finished. One word. If you could possibly say it, he wanted to say it with triumph. He wanted to say it so they could hear it, especially John and his mother and those other women that were down there. But possibly also for those rabbis and priests and others who had caused all the problems, and certainly also for the soldiers, and for the people that were standing out there. He wanted them to know that he was not letting them take his life, he was giving his life. And he wanted to say that message, but he couldn't say it because it was <laughs> so dry. And so he rasped out the words with a whisper, thirst, thirst. He needed moisture. So the common worker, including these soldiers, they couldn't afford good drinks. And unless you lived by fresh water, water was a scarcity. They didn't bottle it in those days. And so water was not readily available. So what the common person drank, what the worker drank, what the, the soldiers had available was what they call sour wine. It was wine that was so old it was cheap. And it was so old it was turning to vinegar. But it still gave you a little kick or whatever old wine does for you. I don't know. And so that's what poor people had. And so that's what they had that day. And when they felt sorry for Jesus, so they found a sponge of some sort, stuck it on a stick, dipped it into that sour wine, and held it up to Jesus touched his lips, and he squeezed a little bit of it out so it'd squirrel around in his mouth. Swirl around. Did I say squirrel? <laughs> I'm so dry. And gave him just enough moisture so he could utter the words, finished. Finished. His pain-wrecked body and his physical thirst show the human side of Jesus. Desperate for moisture, 
Jesus did not take the easy way out. He endured all of the pain of the cross. He was a man's man. He was the Son of God. But there was a deeper meaning to his thirst. I thirst emphasizes our spiritual need. Our spiritual need. When we think about Jesus and being thirsty, our minds, like John, can quickly go to some of the teachings of Jesus concerning thirst. I thought Sam was going to steal my thunder. Because he already quoted this, Jesus at the, at the well with a woman, the Samaritan woman there. In John 4, 14, John wrote, writes these words. You've got to think about this. He's the one that says, I thirst. Quotes Jesus saying that. And he writes this story where Jesus said to this woman, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become to him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. A few pages later, in John's Gospel, he writes the story of Jesus coming to the temple. And there in the crowd in the temple in John 7, verses 37 and 38, Jesus says to those who are there, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Of course, John was there when Sermon on the Mount was given in one of the Beatitudes, maybe one of my favorites, recorded in Mark's gospel, or Matthew's gospel, 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the tense of the verbs is such that it says, blessed are those who hunger and keep on hungering. Blessed are those who thirst and keep on thirsting for righteousness. For they will be filled. Keep on thirsting. Andrew Murray wrote, Ever thirsting is the secret to never thirsting. I've got that on my door in my office. I read it often. You see, the key to spiritual life is being thirsty for more of God. If we have that same spiritual desire of a person who is dehydrated, who wants more of God, I want water, I want water, I want water. If we can only say, I want Jesus, I want Jesus, I want Jesus. If we can go through life saying, I want more of God. If that's our attitude, and the only thing that will satisfy is Jesus, I thirst, I thirst, I want you, I want you. Ever thirsting will keep you from never thirsting. Because if you keep seeking God with that kind of passion, and that kind of energy and that kind of desire, guess what? You will never be looking for answers out there. Because Jesus is the one who satisfies. Blessed is the one who hungers and thirsts and keeps on thirsting for righteousness because he will be filled. Ever thirsting will keep you from thirsting. Because Jesus satisfies he has living water springing up and overflowing. And once you taste and see that the Lord is good, the sour wine of the world will never satisfy. 
Because Jesus refreshes like nothing else. No doubt there have been times in your life when you've had that kind of thirst for God. I'm reminded every week that people dealing with life, which is full of hurts and bad habits and hang-ups and hates. That's life. It's very hurtful. People disappoint us. People misunderstand us. Heartache follows heartache. Hurt follows hurt. That's life. And somehow the the world always projects that there's a different life. But most of us know the reality is not that life out there where they live heavily ever after. And everything always turns out, and the, the prince gets his princess, and, and they ride off into the sunset together, and everything's going to be wonderful. If you could just get through high school, everything's going to be wonderful. And the truth of the matter is, we know it. It's just hurt after heartache, after hang up, after problem, after misunderstanding. After, that's, that's the way most of life is. Because why? It's not God's life, it's the devil's life, and he's out to destroy us. Sin is here because of the devil, evil is here because of the devil, and he's out to destroy this world. He's doing a good job of it. And he causes people to hurt other people. It's a constant thing. And because of sin, we have all the evils of the world which bring death. And so people blame God for something he did not cause. Evil and sin caused it. And so there's a thirst It's built into the system. And most of life outside of God is dry. It's a desert experience. It leaves people drained and thirsty and needing something that will saturate and fill every cell and once again make you vibrant and feel like life is worth living. And the only thing that will really fill that longing, I'm telling you, is Jesus Christ. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You can doll it. You can dope it. You can, you know, party it. You can do whatever you want. But the next morning you wake up and you have less money and more headache. The only thing that comes and saturates, the only thing that comes and fills, the only thing that really satisfies is Jesus In this world you will have trouble, Jesus said. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It is finished. So run to Dr. Ruth or Dr. Phil or Dr. Whoever, Houston. Dr. Oprah, she'll solve it all. And Dr. Oz. And fake doctor on ER. And whatever other medical show you watch. Or you can go to the great physician. Because Jesus is the only 
answer to spiritual thirst. Most of life outside of God is dry desert, and people are spiritually thirsty. So throughout our lives, (laughs) and especially every Sunday, as Christians, we hold out our cups to God and plead for refreshing spiritual drinks. Oh God, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup. We come on Sundays and we fill up. Why? Because we're going out to a dry, desert, thirsty land. And we need all that we can get. And some of us, we're so weird, we come again throughout the week. Fill my cup. I need more. I need a Bible study. I need a prayer group. I need a meeting. Why? Because I'm out there and it's dry and it's thirsty. And I need Jesus. And that's why we open the word every day. And that's why we get on our prayer bones every day. That's why we have a prayer closet every day. That's why we talk to God and read his word. Why? Because we're thirsty and people are draining us. Our families are draining us. Even the unsaved are draining us. Got a text from one of my daughters this week going through a bad time. We're praying for you. But oh, I wish they'd find Jesus. Have that resource. So we come, and I'm so glad for Sundays. I'm so glad for a Saturday morning prayer meeting when the guys pray for me and pray for each other and the needs. And I, I'm so glad for Wednesday night when we get together in our groups, we pray for each other. And I'm so glad for those Bible studies. And <laughs> why well, I, I want to get filled. I, want, I need more drops, more drops. And sometimes during the week, all I can do is just come and pray. And, oh, God, I can't, I can't handle it. I can't fix people. I can't solve all this world. It's a dry, dreary, dead world out there. And it's just soaking everything that got out of me. Fill me up, Lord. I didn't know I was going to spend all this time on this. but You need it. So I just want a Gatorade bath. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care that it'll stick all over and the rest of the day. You wonder how those guys feel. But I just want to be wet by Jesus. Right? I just want to be filled with something that satisfies. Because you don't find it out there. No, you will not. Thank you for Sundays. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ because you encourage and help and strengthen each other. We thirst. God fills us. And to the sinner, let me say, there is nothing in the world of sin and evil that will satisfy your inner spiritual thirst like Jesus will. He died on the cross to wash you clean from sin. You will never be satisfied. You will never be filled until you experience the living water that comes from Jesus Christ. There is a fountain. (laughs) As Lucy J. Ryder wrote the song, Ho, everyone that is thirsty in spirit. Whoever one that is weary and sad, come to the fountain, there's fullness in Jesus. All that you're longing for, come and be blessed or fed or whatever it is. I will pour water, Jesus says. 
On him who is thirsty, I will pour floods upon the dry ground. Open your hearts for the gift I am bringing. While you are seeking me, I will be found. Jesus' death on the cross is a direct fulfillment of Scripture, a direct fulfillment of God's plan for our salvation, a direct fulfillment of eternal life. cross and the resurrection. Jesus' physical dehydration shows that Jesus is willing to suffer so that we don't have to suffer. And Jesus' dehydration gives us the question, are you spiritually thirsty this morning? Do you have a desire to quench your Hunger and thirst for God. Because I'm telling you, nothing else will meet that need. Nothing else will meet your spiritual need. As dry as I'm feeling right now, nothing's going to do it except a sip of water here in a moment. And as dry as I get spiritually, nothing does it but Jesus. It's the only thing that'll fill you up again so you can continue to live the Christian life. And if you're not a Christian, it's the only thing that will finally satisfy all the dry desert wilderness experiences that you're living. Oh, it's still a desert out there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not promising you something. But you won't be dry. They will be, but you won't be. If you're tapped into Jesus, he has the resources to satisfy the longings of your inner being. As the praise team gets ready, we have family altar time at our church. I say this every Sunday. Come and pray. Talk to Jesus about anything that you want. Whatever your needs may be, you come and talk to Jesus about it. But if you're feeling kind of thirsty or dry this morning, haven't talked to Jesus in a while, you just may need a a bathing, a cleansing, a cleaning up, a, a filling of that warm water or the cold water You know, just something about a glass of water with the ice tickling in it and the sweat running down the outside. You just want to go, that's what Jesus feels like to me. Just just to know, cool, refreshing Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you right now. We thank you. That you have the ability to, de- to saturate us with Jesus and his presence through the Spirit so that we can feel, we can feel quenched. We can feel bathed. We can feel cleansed. We can feel saturated. We can feel whole again. And here in our congregation, there's people that have been going through a lot. There's been physical things. There's been spiritual issues. There's been financial issues. There's been family issues. There's been relationship issues. There's just been work issues. There's been hurt. And Sunday they come here and they hold their cup up and they say, well, God, fill me up again. So I pray today for a deluge from God. I pray that you'll fill up our cups, Lord, as we hold them out to you. Fill our cups. And help us to feel your presence again, oh God, in this altar time. Fill us up with you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together, come and pray. Come and talk to Jesus about your dryness. Symbolically today, it would just be awesome if we could just take whatever it is and bring it to the cross and let it go. 
right? If, if you're just tired of the dryness and tired of that issue and whatever it is, in your mind's eye, can you just take it and bring it to the cross and release it to Jesus? Here it is, Lord. Because that's what God wants you to do with it. And then, like the song they just said, <laughs> then you got to turn your hands and your cups up to Jesus to say, fill me with your love, with your tenderness, with your joy, with your peace, with, with all those things that God has promised, your grace. <laughs> so I'm asking you today to drop it off. Release it. Release that person. Release that problem. Release that hindrance. Release that decision, whatever it is. Release it. And then turn up and accept what God has to give you today. Amen. Lord, that sin's got to go. <laughs> that bad habit's got to go. That bad attitude's got to go. <laughs> that tough decision, Lord, that I can't make. That person that gives me fits at work. Oh, Lord, whatever it is. Lord, here, I'm going to bring them to you, and I'm going to put them here, and I'm going to release them. And, uh, Lord, I just want you to saturate me now. It's Sunday. Fill me up. Fill me with you, Lord. Fill me with you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm thirsty today, and you're the only thing that will satisfy. I thirst for you. I can't solve the world and its problems. I can't. But I can drop it off at the feet of Jesus and accept more of your grace and more of your love and more of your mercy. You will help me. I am your child. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I can't fix people, but you can. I can't fix problems, but you can. I can't solve the world, no. <laughs> I can't even take care of my own needs half the time, Lord. I need you. You can fix it. You can fill me. You can satisfy. I can't do it, but you can. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, we just open our arms up to you and our cups up to you today. <laughs> fill me, Lord. Fill us. Fill us with you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Help us as we worship you, Jesus. Help us as we call on you, Jesus. Help us as we minister to a dry and thirsty land. Help us, Lord, as we minister to, to family members that don't know Christ. Help us, Lord, as we minister to people at work who don't know Jesus. Help us, Lord, as we give out cool water all week long. Lord, fill us up today so we can be the bottle-giving station throughout the week. Amen. God, help us today. You want us to be dispensers of Jesus and his love wherever we go. And so we're calling on you today. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us up. Fill us up. Thank you for this message. Thank you, Lord, for the truth and the way it spoke to me. <laughs> I need you. I need you. We need you. Your people need you today. You have the resources, and so thank you, Lord. 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 Amen.